afternoon session. My name is Milica Todorovic. I come from the University of Turku in Finland, and I'm one of the organizers of this meeting, so I hope you're all enjoying it. And uh, the first speaker in this afternoon session is Lars Bango from uh, Ruhr in Bochum, and he will be telling us about some machine learning and data-driven studies on experimental data. So thank you very much. Go ahead, Lars. So hello, everybody. Can you uh, understand me okay? What's on the back? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me the invitation and the, the, um, yeah, to, to present here um, a little bit of our experimental work. Um, and I would like to start with a brief introduction. Okay. Uh, with a brief introduction in uh, what we are doing at the Chair for Materials Discovery and Interfaces. Uh, this is the chair of Professor Alfred Ludwig, and I'm a postdoc in his group. And um, what we do here is we um, do combinatorial material science. So we use combinatorial magnetron sputtering to create composition gradients and uh, or also synthesize um, process gradients. And then we perform high throughput uh, characterization. We can, for example, go for structural properties um, using electron microscopy or X-ray diffraction but also electrical, optical, and magnetic properties, um, as well as we are looking into shape memory alloys and also thermoelectrics. Let me briefly uh, introduce you to magnetron sputtering. Uh, so on the left side, you can, you can see such a, a magnetron sputtering chamber from the inside. And we have here uh, four cathodes. Uh, this could also be like more than four, five to six, seven, eight cathodes. And on these cathodes, you can place the base material from that from which you want to create a composition gradient. We have then here in the center, the substrate. And as you can see here in the video, we are spraying or like sputtering from individual sources simultaneously. And if we keep the substrate as a static state, then we can comp uh, create composition gradients. So instead of having a single chemical composition in these uh, kind of uh, libraries, uh, on a, on a silicon wafer, we uh, can create continuous gradients of composition. And if we then put a coordinate grid through them, then uh, our standard grid would be 340 roughly uh, measurement points uh, that can be characterized using automated high throughput techniques. And so then you have the gradients over the substrate area. You can um, screen them and identify for the property of interest and thereby map chemical composition to materials properties. Our typical uh, way how we describe the high throughput materials innovation cycle is we start with some kind of hypothesis, for example, from uh, you theory guys. And uh, then we go to the lab, synthesize a set of materials libraries. We perform a high throughput characterization, uh, the properties that we can do, I already mentioned. And uh, so from this uh, relatively large data sets, then we can uh, perform a data analysis um, for example, um, first visualize the data, look at the data, try to identify trends, select a region of interest with a material that has the properties that we would like to, that we are looking for, and then perform an in-depth characterization of those regions of interest with more expensive techniques like atom probe tomography or transmission electron microscopy. And uh, based on that, then probably you can, you can go ahead and process these materials libraries so you can uh, achieve different processing states by annealing them, for example, or oxidizing them, and uh, can repeat the cycle and uh, hopefully identify the new material of the future. And there are several opportunities provided by artificial intelligence in this uh, materials uh, innovation cycle, which is first of all to speed up the data analysis, but then also to visualize uh, large data sets. So for example, here dimensionality reduction is really a game changer because you can suddenly compare uh, relatively large data sets. And in the past, it was kind of complicated to do that. And uh, active learning is, uh, is a good opportunity to speed up further the analysis. Um, for example, we would like to identify synthesis composition property relationships, but also guiding of the experimentation is where AI can help us. And I've brought uh, several uh, use cases that we have been um, investigating in the past years today to present to you. And the first one is to identify uh, the influence of process parameters on the microstructure of thin films uh, in order to 
Yeah, well, let, let me start by this. So actually the magnetron sputtering process is um, relatively complicated physics. So you can see here inside such a reactor, we have here the cathode with the target, which is the material that we would like to deposit. And so on the target, there are atomistic processes going on. So we, we are um, accelerating argon ions towards the target. Um, and then um, a material is removed from the target, transported through the plasma. And during the transport, there's interactions with other plasma species. Um, for example, collisions that uh, where the material, uh, the particles lose energy. And uh, then they land on the substrate, they condense there. Um, there can be diffusion depending on the process parameters. And uh, yeah, then the uh, particles nucleate and the film grows. And so depending on, on how you choose process parameters like, uh, like the ion energy or the degree of ionization of the sputtered particles, but also the substrate temperature and generally the chemical composition, but also impurity elements, uh, depending on all of this, the outcome uh, is uh, a thin film with, with uh, different microstructure or with, with different structural properties. For example, we have the morphology, roughness, density, uh, grain size, but also a crystal structure um, related properties that are being changed by the deposition parameters. And the idea is now in order to, to handle this, this complexity of the parameter space, uh, to bypass the, the uh, physical processes inside the plasma reactor by, um, by a, a artificial intelligence model. And so this is um, what has been typically done in the past is um, the, there was an introduction by uh, John A. Thornton in 1972 of uh, so-called structure zone diagrams, where this is a low dimensional representation of possible microstructure types that you can, or a characteristic microstructures that you can achieve in a magnetron sputter process depending on only two parameters, which are the pressure and the deposition temperature in relation to the melting temperature of the material. And so this was done for refractory metals. And um, this um, works in a way that you can, for example, go to this diagram and you like, if you would like a, a characteristic structure that is porous and not very dense, then you use a relatively high pressure and a low temperature. Then basically the diffusion of the atoms is reduced they lose a lot of energy in the plasma and uh, you end up with a porous microstructure. If you would like to have a dense microstructure, you would increase the, the temperature and reduce the pressure because then you increase the ion energy and the film is densified by a bombarding a species. If you then even increase the temperature further then you, uh, and this kind of microstructure is then uh, like a columnar microstructure. And if you increase the temperature further, then you end up with uh, large grains that are like similar to uh, bulk materials. Um, so this is, was a relatively simple model. They had to do a lot of experiments and then draw the sketch up these, these structure zone diagrams. Um, however, the modern plasma reactors have much more parameters that you can vary and uh, individually vary. And therefore the, the parameter space is larger. And so the idea now is, can we use an AI model to predict such kind of microstructure uh, structure zone diagrams. And uh, this was a collaboration with Yuri Lysogorsky and Ralf Drauz from ICAMS. And uh, we ended up uh, using a, a conditional GAN, conditional generative adversarial network, where we use the process parameters as, um, as the conditional inputs. And we trained then on experimental microstructure images from a, from a data set of chromium aluminum oxynitride uh, ceramic film films. And um, yeah, so as a first comparison between uh, if the model is able to predict the kind of microstructure. So first we should say that there's a lot of variation in the microstructure and microstructure images are rather complex to describe and complex to, um, to grasp what you are seeing there. And so the first uh, impression was that the conditional GAN was able to relatively good pre reproduce the, uh, the microstructure images that were in the data set. And uh, you can, for example, see that if you have a faceted microstructure here, then you can also clearly see in the, in the conditional uh, GAN um, a, a similar microstructure, but also if the grains are getting smaller, then the predicted grains are getting smaller. Um, there is, it is a little bit problematic when the, when, the feature, when the features get too big, too large, because then the, the uh, model is somehow 
um, pr producing a finer, finer uh, microstructure. Okay, but um, this was just really to see if it's somehow working. But the next thing then, of course, would be, can we also extrapolate or like predict inside this five-dimensional parameter space different microstructural outcomes? And uh, so this is then what we do. We take uh, two parameters that we can vary and three parameters are kept constant. And then we can produce such kind of microstructure overview maps. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see the, the difference here. But if you take a close look, then you can see that there's a variation of the microstructure. And we have here on the one axis the deposition temperature, and here the aluminum concentration in chromium aluminum nitride. And uh, this by itself is a little bit tough. So you could, in principle, now identify the microstructure that you would like to uh, achieve and then uh, select the deposition parameters with which you, you most likely will achieve them. What we then did is uh, train a convolutional neural network to predict from microstructure image um, a microstructure type. So it's like a classification model. And since the GAN has, um, has the randomized uh, input uh, latent, latent parameters, it is possible to produce for each condition multiple variations of the microstructure type. And so then the, the CNN can predict the microstructure type of, um, of multiple microstructural representations. And by that, you can get a probabilistic uh, microstructure map. And so here you can then say, okay, if I would like to have a certain microstructure type, which is, for example, let's say fine-grained here. I want to have a fine-grained microstructure, then I should increase the aluminum concentration as high as possible and keep the temperature relatively low. Um, or on the other hand, if you want to have a faceted microstructure, then the probability of having a faceted microstructure is highest at higher temperature and uh, up to a certain um, aluminum concentration. And then you can also draw in like the boundaries where, where you know um, that are physical, physical boundaries. For example, if the aluminum concentration is too high, then you would change to a um, hexagonal structure, which you would like to avoid. And therefore you can uh, limit yourself into this region and use this to, to optimize the process parameters. Like this was one example out of my PhD thesis. And uh, the next thing I would like to show is how we use um, AI agents for X-ray diffraction analysis. Uh, but it could also be any kind of spectral light data. And so X-ray diffraction is being used for crystal structure classification in our approach. So we have a machine that can measure um, all fully automated, uh, the, the 340 measurement areas and produce such uh, X-ray diffractograms, which are characteristic for the crystal structure that we're investigating. However, there's a challenge because what you typically then do is in order to, to classify a microstructure, you would compare the experimental XRD pattern with reference pattern from, from literature. But imagine you would have to do this 340 times and uh, maybe there's like 20, 30, 50 possible uh, phases that you can select from literature. So then you would have to do a lot of comparison and um, this is a tedious task and it used to take us months to do that. Um, and the essential problem that we have is that um, the, the quality of the X-ray diffraction data and thin films is not always very good. So depending on the growth parameters that I just explained, you can get um, crystal growth in a certain direction and therefore you have texture in your XRD pattern, which means that if you would have typically five characteristic peaks, since the crystal is growing only in one direction, we can only measure the single peak and the others are um, are not visible. And so this means that we lose a lot of information um, due to the film growth um, and, and the subsequent measurements. And so what you have basically is a trade-off between the number of possible phases that you have on the one side from reference structures and the data quality uh, of the X-ray diffraction. And so if you have, for example, um, high data quality, then you could probably classify a large number of possible phases. However, the, the worst case is if you have very low quality and a high number of possible phases. And this is often the case in especially super alloys or high entropy alloys, where just the, the chemical space is relatively large and therefore there's also uh, lots, of, lots of possible crystal structures. And so this uh, demands somehow for a model that can handle 
the uncertainty that is represented in the X-ray diffraction data. And um, this is what we have been trying to achieve uh, with this study. So let me give you some brief examples of what kind of aberrations we can have in thin film patterns. So typically you would, if you have a certain material system, uh, cobalt, nickel, aluminum, you would go to a reference database, look for all possible combinations of cobalt, nickel, and aluminum, and check what, what crystal structures um, would be possible theoretically. Then you would obtain uh, such kind of stick patterns where the individual peaks um, on the diffraction angles are plotted like this. And these you would have to typically compare to the experimental pattern. However, then we have the challenge that if, um, if the film grows in preferred orientation, you only have certain peaks and others are completely uh, invisible. Then you have texture, which means that the relative ratios of the peaks are changing. Um, another problem is that you could have two different crystal structures, but due to texture and to, um, to strain, they produce the exact same X-ray diffraction pattern. And you can, of course, also have noise depending on the grain size. If you have small grains, you get a lot of noise and a relatively low signal. And um, these are the problems that we are having. And so therefore you need to have some kind of model that can, um, or now I'll introduce the crystallography companion agent for autonomous phase identification. So the idea here is to use a synthetic data set, simulate physically correct X-ray diffraction patterns by accompanying all the possible variations in X-ray diffraction patterns that we can observe experimentally. And this is then roughly 100,000 patterns per, per phase that we have in a material system. Then we use an ensemble of neural networks that uh, classify the structure trained on the data set, uh, on the synthetic data set. And then we can use the real data set and perform phase classification using the ensemble network. And then there will be an ensemble vote and you will have some kind of probabilistic output um, of the phase classification. So this is how the, how the pipeline looks. So gathering the, the data from the ICSD, for example, then simulating the data set. Um, these are the, the ensemble networks. And then we, will, uh, we are using two kind of um, uh, phase probabilities. The one is only based on the X-ray diffraction pattern and the second one takes also into account the chemical composition. And then we can perform some kind of multimodal analysis. And um, the idea is that the companion agent only gives a rough estimate of what kind of structure there is so that the human can in the end decide what, um, what is the most likely crystal structure. Um, yeah, what we, what we observed also is that compared to a single learner that has always 100% uncertainty, 100% uh, certainty, uh, an ensemble um, scales with the variations in the X-ray diffraction data. So if you, for example, artificially decrease the, the quality in the data, then you would also see that the, that the uncertainty of the ensemble uh, networks go down. And this is exactly what we wanted to achieve. Another metric that we were also investigating is that with um, increasing data size, the model actually becomes better. So it is really the, the large number of uh, physically correct simulations that we can do that helps, uh, helps with good classification. And so, yeah, then here is the final result of the um, experimental data set. So we can use, see, see here the ternary um, plot of a nickel cobalt aluminum materials library. So we were able to cover uh, almost 100% of the composition space in one materials library, like a 100 millimeter wafer. Um, then there were these, the, the typical 340 measurement points where an X-ray diffraction pattern is taken. And then you can see here in this ternary diagram, the phase probability first only on X, based on X-ray diffraction. And uh, you can see here that this is uh, for nickel cobalt three aluminum. And you can see that the probability also spreads out quite large. And this is due to the fact that the, the crystal structure might be similar. So there could be a match based on crystal structure. However, due to the chemical composition of this phase, the classification should be, should be um, bounded into a region where the chemical composition actually makes it reasonable that this phase is existing here. And so if you include the chemical composition between the uh, reference pattern and the actual measured composition, then you can reduce the, uh, the classification boundaries um, to, a, to a reasonable region in the, um, in the composition space. And so this is for comparison then uh, a 
an analysis performed by a human expert. So um, my, my colleague, Dennis Noyox was able to classify 20, more than 20 different face regions um, manually. Probably it took him a very long time. And um, you can achieve now similar results using the um, XCAD, the crystallography companion agent. We're also benchmarking this approach um, with uh, other models. There's the um, physics informed uh, model by um, Ovido et al. And uh, they were basically simulating X-ray diffraction patterns in a non-physical way in the sense that there are patterns that are unphysical but still representative somehow for the, for the data. And uh, we were comparing uh, when we used the ensemble method on the data approach by, um, by AutoXRD and we were comparing XC, XCA with the data from AutoXRD and the other way around. Um, so the take home message is that only if you use the physically correct um, measurement, uh, the physically correct uh, simulation and the ensemble, uh, you achieve relatively high accuracy. But then there can still be some edge cases. For example, what is if you have a pattern in your data set so if you produce the material that has never been synthesized before, then it will probably be hard to identify. Um, so first of all, if you just look for, for the typical phases, you would never find a reference structure that you could compare to. And then the question is, can we find a model that can help us with detecting out of distribution data, thereby informing the scientist, hey, this, this X-ray diffraction pattern is very unlikely that can be classified by, by, um, by your model uh, because it's not represented there. And uh, therefore we just um, used a variational autoencoder to learn uh, representations of X-ray diffraction patterns, which can actually be helpful uh, in, uh, for, for a lot of things. Um, so first of all, we took the same pipeline. We uh, took reference structures from the databases, simulated the relatively large synthetic training data set, trained a variational autoencoder, and afterwards, uh, we have a representation of crystal structures. This is now the, the synthetic data set of um, a FCC, BCC, and a, a HCP structure. And you can see here in this, rel uh, in this representation relatively nicely the, the symmetry of the crystals that we have. So if we have a FCC pattern in this angular range, we have basically three peaks that are occurring. And um, this representation is nice because you can use it on the fly for a rough estimate of structural similarity. So this means that, for example, in this case where we have the red and the blue pattern here, they are textured along a certain axis and therefore they produce a relatively similar um, pattern. And we can observe this directly here in this latent space. Uh, there is a proximity between the, uh, these two, but they are somehow still separated because it's uh, different classes of materials. And this is, um, yeah, this is an interesting thing for um, on the fly visualization, like during the measurement or very brief overview analysis. You can also use this to train then a, um, this representation to train a, a classifier. This was just a, um, a plain simple um, k nearest uh, neighbors classifier. And so then depending on where in this, uh, in this latent space, the uh, X-ray diffraction pattern is located, you can uh, make a rough, rough estimate of crystal structure. But then the question is what happens if we have the pattern that is not represented in the data set? It would still fall in this latent space. However, it is actually, it is, um, it is not this kind of structure. And uh, there you can use the reconstruction error of the variational autoencoder to, um, to easily spot that the reconstruction error is almost uh, one order of magnitude larger than of all the other patterns. And therefore you have a a way to inform yourself that this kind of data is not represented by the model. And this is uh, actually very helpful uh, in experimental um, um, X-ray diffraction classification then, because you can have also phase mixtures. And this is a really combinatorial problem. If you imagine there are 20 possible phases and you can even have all kinds of mixtures of these phases, then you end up with a huge data set that you cannot handle anymore. And so in this case, we could show that uh, when creating artificially phase mixtures, the uh, model uncertainty or the, actually the reconstruction error would increase. And thereby, this can be a metric to inform that the, certain, that the pattern is, um, for example, a phase mixture and not a single phase. 
Right, and then, so coming back to the experiment then, um, we have here then again a materials library of a cobalt chrome nickel rhenium. And uh, we have been mapping uh, the, the typical, uh, in this case, it was a square grid 225 X-ray diffraction patterns. And you pass the data set through the autoencoder and it directly can, can highlight the regions where the phase classification uh, is, is challenging. And these are, we could show that are mostly phase regions that include uh, multiple phases instead of a single phase. Okay, now um, towards the last parts. What, is, what would be really nice if, if um, or let me start differently. So typically, um, if we create such a materials library, it could be a um, high entropy alloy or a ternary system. Um, you have sometimes relatively simple um, trends over this materials library. And so hence, if you measure 350 data points, then it's actually much more than you should have measured because you're just measuring more data points in a very simple trend. And the idea then here is if you can, if the, if the um, measurement device can directly identify that there is only a simple trend, then it does not need to measure uh, so many data points. And so this is where we use um, active learning and what you can see here is the original data on the left side. So this is the electrical resistance of a high entropy alloy. And you can see here then the GP, the prediction by a Gaussian process and the uncertainty or the, the covariance by a Gaussian process. And by initializing randomly or with, a, with maybe five measurement points, you can start with an, uh, with an initial fit. And then afterwards you're sampling the uncertainty of the model and the measurements are only occurring where the uncertainty is highest and thereby you optimize um, the prediction during the measurement. And uh, this can be seen now, hopefully. Yeah. So you can see that the machine now decides on its own where to measure. And after only roughly 30, data, 30 measurements, you can see that the model converges and that the fit is, is relatively good. I mean, there's always some kind of variation in the measurements. And uh, this means that a simple trend like this could easily be measured with only 30 data points uh, instead of 350, which is a huge, um, yeah, huge gain in, in time. Um, yeah, this basically shows the, the same plot, um, but you can, you can then see where the machine was measuring and, and how it went through the materials library to characterize it. Right, then uh, one last topic that I would like to address is how can we scale with the chemical complexity? Because there is an issue, issue associated, or let's start with the motivation. So uh, high entropy alloys have been observed to be re relatively good um, um, electrocatalysts, for example, for the hydrogen evolution or the uh, oxygen evolution reaction. And uh, this effect is due to the, uh, they call it high entropy effect, but basically in high entropy alloys you are producing statistical distributions of active sites where um, that can act as, as catalyst centers. And so it was observed that if you take individual elements like iron, nickel, cobalt, manganese, which by themselves are very poor catalysts, if you combine them in high entropy alloy as a nanoparticle, you can achieve the performance of a, of a platinum catalyst. And uh, so this they describe as the high entropy effect and hence, it's very interesting to investigate uh, such kind of materials as well. There is, however, first of all, the, the problematic that there is a huge number of possible quinary systems. If you consider roughly 50 chemical elements that could be technically uh, produced and, and used in, uh, in our systems. And so you would have more than 2 million possibilities of quinary systems, for example. And th this is the one problem, but the second problem is that while you can produce a ternary system by, by uh, magnetron sputtering in full, like 100% compositional coverage, um, if, you use, if you go to a quaternary system, you are only producing a two-dimensional cut of the quaternary space. So this is visualized here. And if you go to quinary space, this is then even uh, yeah, further dramatized. And um, in the end, in a quinary space, like one materials library has only 0.5% of the compositions in the quinary composition space. And this is then not any more high throughput or, or impressive. It's basically just a, a point in the center that you're measuring and you're missing out on everything else. 
And so we came up with a, um, with a strategy to overcome this. Um, the simplest way that we thought of is, okay, there's the, the problem is that the geometry plays a role now because when you deposit from five uh, deposition sources on a two dimensional substrate, it's always a cut uh, through the space. And therefore you can uh, permutate the cathodes and by permutating the cathodes, you are producing a different cut in the quinary space. And uh, there are 24 possible uh, permutations. And so we produced a, uh, we did some ranking of the, or we, we simulated the coverage by the deposition and uh, performed a ranking and ranked the materials in the way, or the, the permutations in the way that the permutation that will produce the next highest coverage is always synthesized next. And uh, with this approach, we're able then to, with only, if you only consider the five to 35 atomic percent region in the quinary composition space to reach up to 30% of that with only six permutations. This, however, then uh, creates properties in the center of the composition space. And from that you could extrapolate and maybe also do active learning in order to further explore these large composition spaces. All right, so with this, I'm already at the end of my talk and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Lars, for giving us an insight into many different things that are possible to do with experimental data. Any questions? Don't be shy, Patrick. <laughs> Thank you for the, the very nice talk, very impressive. The, can I come back to this X-ray companion? The, you had this comparison to the, the human, right? That was very interesting. Uh, and the, you said there was one before, the three triangles. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, this one. Yeah. yeah. So you said that, so the map in the middle was your best one from the companion, right? Well, it's basically just showing that that by using these different um, probabilities, you can somehow uh, constrain the, the prediction to be or like the, the phase probability to be high in only the region where it should be high physically. So there's, for example, it does not make sense that um, a certain structure uh, is, for example, in this region because there is no um, or the chemical composition is not uh, supporting it. I see. So is the agent only looking for one phase? Because the diagram on the right by the human looks a lot richer in color than the others oh, yeah. that come so, from the machine. Uh, yeah, we know it's looking for all the phases simultaneously and um, distributing the probability also for all phases. It's just It was just a simpler way to represent it. Um, we did not plot actually the real results by the agent. We just measured the accuracy. Uh, so this plot, this plot was actually produced by a person, and uh, there's only this region here that we compared in this in this plot. But actually, you could produce the same plot uh, by XCA as well. I see. So the machine does identify the other. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Any more questions for Lars? This is pretty good because I have a ton of questions. Um, Kevin, anything on Zoom? No? Okay, good. Well, I'll start. Uh, we have a few minutes before our next talk. So one thing I did want to ask you is, um, how large are your data sets? So from an individual sample, how many data can you retrieve? And do you actually, for the same experiment, so same combination of elements, do you generate multiple samples um so to the first question it's uh, it's always this typically this fixed grid that we are producing so 350 you know. samples um that are then located differently in the composition space depending on uh, we, we can go from binary systems to quinary quaternary um and then the compositional coverage on is, is not so good anymore um the second question so it's always 350 350 per wafer 
yeah, roughly 350 per wafer, and we can produce um, we can produce re reproductions of the same wafer with relatively good um, or with, with no, not a lot of variance. So we can produce two times the same materials level, basically. That was going to be my next uh, question. How much of the statistical reproducibility noise do you have, and right. do you did you actually take this into account into in the models? Did you integrate this noise in the model? Well, we, I mean, if you would perform the same measurement on the same spot twice, then depending on the measurement system, you could have a noise and, and variation there. But uh, we also get statistics from the neighboring points. So mm -hmm. typically you could assume that there's some kind of trend with the property and the chemical composition, except you have something like nickel titanium where there is 51% uh, boundary where there is the effect or not. These would probably miss, but if you if you assume a continuous gradient, then by looking at the surrounding data points, and you can see if there's if the trend is reasonable, then this is also a kind of qualitative metric. So, the, so you do use the continuous gradients to smooth out your data if needed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I, how about any further questions? If not, maybe I can. Oh, Patrick. So I so saw when you did the active learning, uh, I saw that your Bayesian optimization also sampled the edges of the wafer a lot. Yeah. Do you, and, and this makes sense because it doesn't have, uh, uh, well, that's where it's most uncertain, right? It's, you know, it doesn't know how the function continues outside the, uh, the, the boundary. Um, have so you, if you, if you, if you go to the one after the animation, yeah, there. Okay. So a lot of the numbers are actually on the boundary, and we we also observe this, and it seems to be something that's very hard to get rid of in Bayesian optimization if you don't have continuous variables. So because the model is trying to, or the, the uncertainty is pushed towards the the boundaries. Yeah. Of the yeah. Have you have you noticed this, and have you thought of ways to get rid of this to be even more efficient in sampling, if if you needed to? So far, uh, not. No, we we only did so far the first um, implementation of this, and we actually have a measurement test stand that can do this this kind of sampling. Um, but we are now, and that's actually also the point that we have to do. We have to, in order to gain trust in these methods, because mm. to, in this case, I mean, we know the data, but if we don't know the data and how it's represented. Right, right. Then you need to have some way of stopping the model where it says, "Okay, yes. this is the, the uncertain. The global uncertainty is now relatively low. I stop the measurement." And so we are now trying to um, set up an automated uh, benchmarking um, platform so that each materials library that is that is measured with this machine, everything is stored, and afterwards the GP runs with different parameters. And then over a period of time, we would like to to uh, see what kind of stable parameters can we use for, for this yeah. process. You can throw in a few measurement points as test set and then always compare your model against it. Yeah, yeah. or something like this, yeah. So this is what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thanks again, Lars, for your talk. You. Our next speaker is Idu Chen from Aalto University in Finland. And while Edu is preparing, I wanted to make an announcement.